the family, to know you more. Lord, not to simply rise to some kind of intellectual ascent, but that we would learn more of you, that we might become more like you. So Lord, as we open your word, I pray you open our heart, that Lord, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that we may understand all that you have for us. That Lord, through the power of your word, the presence of your spirit, Lord, you would touch our hearts afresh. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's saints say, amen. 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 Please be seated. And amen, and amen. Wow. Well, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 21, verse 18. Acts chapter 21, verse 18. Uh, last time we were together, we had concluded Paul's third missionary journey. As Paul was making his way back to Jerusalem, he stopped at Caesarea. That would be Caesarea Maritime, there on the coast of Israel, the capital of Palestine for about 500 years under Roman rule. And there in the house of Philip came a prophet named Agabus. And Agabus had taken Paul's belt bound his own hands and feet and said, so too will it be to the man who owns this belt. And Agabus had prophesied that Paul, if he went to Jerusalem, would be bound by the Jews and subsequently delivered to the Gentiles. And here in chapter 21, verses 18 through 40, we see in fact that comes to fruition. But none of that moved Paul. It didn't dis dissuade Paul from accomplishing the work that God had called him to do. And what a, a great blessing that ought to be for us, because as God calls us to do his work, to go here, to go there, to do this or to do that, there are things that we're easily dissuaded by. There's things that come up in our hearts and in our lives that cause us to, to pause and to think about, well, should we really go ahead and do that? Well, for Paul, there was no question. It didn't matter how difficult or dangerous the circumstance in his life would be, he was gonna finish the work that God called him to do. And we saw that in fact he did make it to Jerusalem. No doubt to present the relief funds to the poor saints there in Jerusalem, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses one through three. And when he had greeted the brethren there in Jerusalem, they received him gladly. Now, according to verse 18, it was on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, and things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Well then, Paul took them in, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. 
And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander of the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. And when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! And as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago raised an insurrection and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So, when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, and more on that next week. <clears throat> uh, that's where the chapter ends. Now, I didn't divide the chapters in the book, so you can't really blame me for that. <clears throat> However, I think we've bit off enough to chew today in verses 18 through 40. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look what Paul had to say. Now, in verses 18 through 40, as Paul is there in Jerusalem, there are five things we want to look at and learn about as it pertains to this uproar that's about to ensue. Five things for you note takers, you outliners. Number one, first of all, let's take a look at the report from Paul, the report from Paul, that's in verses 18 through 20. And in verses 18 through 20, as Paul gets to Jerusalem, the church is gathered, and he gives them a report about the work of the third missionary journey. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> in verse 18, it says, on, and on the following day, Paul went in with us, now notice Luke, of course, is here with them in Jerusalem, to James and to the elders were present. Now, this particular James is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, James, the brother of John, was killed by Herod back in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. And this particular James, according to uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, seems to be one of the pillars of the church. So he is a church leader, one of the pastors in Jerusalem at the mother church, we would say. Now, the elders that are with him are the presbyteros. The word simply means older. And no doubt the context speaks of one who is older spiritually. So James is gathered together with the church leadership, we would say, or the pastors there in Jerusalem. And when he had greeted them, according to verse 19, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So the whole church leadership is gathered together. Paul has been four years on the road. He comes back to Jerusalem, no doubt delivers the relief funds for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and begins to report the details regarding his missionary journey, the third and final missionary journey. But note carefully, class, he is reporting all the work which God had done in his ministry. Did you catch that? Who did the work on this fourth missionary journey? Well, it was the Lord. And this becomes very significant. 
because Paul recognized and understood that all of the blessing, all of the fruit, all of the benefit that came from this third missionary journey came because God did it. And boy, what an important truth for us to grab a hold of. Because oftentimes when God chooses us and begins to use us, we have a, take, we have a tendency to take credit for it. We say, well, you know, God's a pretty smart feller. It's no wonder he chose me to do the work, you know. I mean, he recognizes great talent when he sees it. Hey, are you kidding me? God uses rocks and donkeys. It's a miracle he uses any of us at all. No, if anything good happens, realize it's God, not us. In fact, Paul would go on to write in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. He said, in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. And if no good thing is in me, certainly no good thing can possibly come from me. So if anything good happens, and I happen to be involved with it, it was all God and not us. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said, it is Christ in you. That's the hope of any glory whatsoever. Man, it's God working in us, Philippians 2, 13, both to will and to do. That's why Paul would go on to say in chapter 14 of the book of Philippians, in verse 13, you all know the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so Paul gave all credit to the Lord. And what a beautiful, beautiful example that sets for us. And according to verse 20, notice the result of that. It says, when they heard it, when the church leadership heard the work that God had done through Paul, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, you see, brethren, or brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Since Paul gave all the credit to the Lord, James and the elders glorified the Lord. We always need to be pointing people to Jesus. We have a tendency to draw people to ourselves, thinking that somehow, well, we've got the answer. Let me help you. Let me pray with you. Let me, you know, no, no. It, we need to be pointing people to the Lord. He's the great counselor. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. And therefore, if anything good happens and we're involved, now all glory goes to the Lord. We can't take any glory or any credit whatsoever. And so they glorified the Lord. Beautiful. Well, let's come to a second thing we want to look at. We've looked at the report from Paul. Now let's take a look at the accusation against Paul. In verses 21 through 26, we see the accusation against Paul. In verse 21, it says, but, here's the contrast, they have been informed, these Jews who've come to faith in Jesus Christ, about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses or to forsake the laws of Moses, specifically saying they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to their customs. Now, clearly, this accusation is untrue. It's unfounded. Paul never taught the Jews not to be circumcised nor to go against the customs of Moses or the laws, we might say. In fact, just the opposite is true. Uh, what happened when he found young Timothy? Well, he circumcised him. So Paul was not against circumcision nor the customs of Moses or the law, we might say. Although Paul did refute the Judaizers, Jews who came to faith in Jesus Christ and said, yes, you need to believe in Jesus to be saved and, and you need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. That's what the Judaizers were saying. So Paul did refute them because salvation doesn't come through outward act of circumcision. It's the circumcision of the heart. It's about what's inside, not about the outside. So Paul clearly stood up against the Judaizers because what they were promoting was what we refer to as legalism. Legalism is adding works 
to the finished work of Christ on the cross. When we say, yes, you have to believe in Jesus Christ and that's legalism. Now, legalism is not when somebody walks up to you and says, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. That's not legalism. That's just good advice. You follow me? That's just wisdom. When somebody says, don't be drunk with wine, that's not legalism. No, the Bible clearly says that in Ephesians 5.18. That's simply saying what the Bible says. That's not being legalistic. No, legalism is adding works to the finished work of Christ on the cross. Well, <laughs> what then, verse 22, what should we do? Well, the assembly must certainly meet. The Sanhedrin's going to gather together once they hear of this news, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. And that all may know that those things of which you were informed, they were informed concerning you, are nothing. They're not true. But that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So the, the, the church leaders, James and the elders, said, you know, Paul, the Sanhedrin's going to hear of the fact that you say not to circumcise, and since that's not true, what you need to do is go ahead and take the vow with these other four men. Now, which vow is being referred to in verse 23? We're not sure. We're not told. It could be the Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6, because a part of that Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6, verse 18, is the shaving of the head and the offering of the sacrifice, which we'll see in verse 26 in just a moment. So those are two aspects of the Nazarite vow. So this could have been the Nazarite vow. And the purification, if you will, was basically saying, I want to be set apart for God. I want to be purified or cleansed. Now remember, Paul had been four years in Gentile territories. So ceremonially speaking, he himself was unclean. He needed to go through the ritual of purification, through the mikvah, through the, the, the dipping in of the water, going under the water, having all of that filth washed off and coming up out of the water as a, a picture of a new creation, if you will, set apart for God, consecrated. Now, in verse 25, it says, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing. They don't have to worry about circumcision or purification. Although there are four things they do need to do, they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, speaking of drinking blood, from things strangled or eating the meat with the blood in it, and from sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage. Now, the contrast to the Jews for the Gentiles are simple. The Jews should adhere to the laws of Moses, including circumcision. The Gentiles don't have to because all of the laws that were given to Moses were given specifically to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. Albeit, the Gentiles should observe a few things. Don't eat food offered to idols. Don't drink blood. Don't eat meat with the blood in it, things that are strangled, and stay away from sexual immorality. Now, note carefully, these four things that the Council of Jerusalem established back in Acts chapter 15 were not for salvation. It wasn't so the, G the Gentiles could be saved. You say, well then, Clark, why did the Council of Jerusalem come up with these four exceptions for the Gentiles? It's so that the Gentiles would not cause the Jews to be offended. So they wouldn't stumble the Jews by their actions as believers, as Christians. And this becomes a huge issue for us. Because we as believers have great liberty. There's no doubt about it. There's great freedom. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul talks about this freedom that we have, this liberty that we've been given. 
But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul says, beware, watch out, take heed, lest this liberty of yours is a stumbling block for others. So while we have liberty and freedom as Christians, our freedom, our liberty stops when it negatively affects another believer, when it causes them to be offended as a weaker brother, when it causes them to trip and to fall, to stumble in their walk with the Lord, then our freedom becomes sin because we have affected a brother or a sister in a negative way. You know, Paul would go on to write in Romans chapter 14, verse 21. He said, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor to do anything that causes a brother to stumble who is weak. And you and I need to be very, very careful in our lives. There's a lot of things we can do, but there's a lot of things we shouldn't do. You know, oftentimes as a pastor, people will come up to me and ask me, can I do this or can I do that? Can I go here or can I go there? And my response often amuses them because I say, sure you can. And they said, can I really? Wow. Of course you can. You can do whatever you want to do. The question is not can I, but should I? Should I do this? Should I do that? We need to ask ourselves, how does it affect other believers? If it causes them to stumble, it's wrong. We shouldn't do it. Ultimately, as Paul would go on to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And whatever we do in our lives, if we're doing it unto the glory of God, now all of a sudden we recognize how important it is to set aside our own Christian liberties and Christian freedoms in light of blessing and ministering to others to bring glory to God. Well, in verse 26, this goes on in dealing with this accusation against Paul. It says, then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, they went through the mikvah, the ritual baths, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So Paul went with the program. Paul went through the exercising of the vow, the purification, the shaving of the head, the offering of the sacrifice. You say, Clark, why did Paul jump through all those hoops? Why did he adhere to all of those rites, rituals, and regulations? It's not because he had to. It's because he wanted to. He didn't want to stumble the Jews. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, Paul said, to the Jews I became as a Jew. To those under the law, as under the law. In verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might win the more. Why did Paul do what he, why all the hype? Why the hoopla? Why the regulations and rules? Why did he go through all of this to to bring his fellow Jews to faith in Jesus Christ? It's not because he had to, he wanted to. And what a, a great example that sets for us. And hopefully we too have that desire to meet people right where they're at. Meet them on their own level, we might say not look down on them or think we're better than them, but to come alongside of them and meet them right where they're at and become all things to all men, setting aside the liberties and freedoms we have to minister to them, to show them the love of Christ. Well, back to Acts chapter 21. Let's come to a third thing we wanna look at. Uh, We've looked at the report from Paul, the accusation against Paul. Now let's take a look at the persecution of Paul. That's in verses 27 through 30. The persecution 
of Paul. In verse 27, it says, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, the seven days of purification for the vow, they saw him in the temple, they stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Now these Jews from Asia probably involved a fellow by the name of Alexander, who back in Acts chapter 19, verse 33, was one who went into the theater there in Ephesus when Demetrius, the silversmith, had raised a, a, a riot against Paul and the Christians. Alexander was a Jew who went into the theater in Ephesus to try to tell the crowd that the Jews had nothing to do with what Paul and the Christians were doing. But they wouldn't have any of it. They, of course, shouted uh, Alexander down, and they lumped him in with the Jews. Now, they were crying out in verse 28, <clears throat> Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people. That's a bit of hyperbole. I think all of us can understand that. We always say, I'm, I'm freezing cold, I'm starving to death. What, really? I mean, you just ate two hours ago. So here they say that he's uh, teaching all men everywhere against the people, which speaks of the nation of Israel, the law, the law of Moses, and this place, the temple. In fact, he also brought Greeks into the temple according to their accusation and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Now, this deals with the persecution of Paul. Uh, at the end of verse 32, we'll see they were beating Paul. In verse 31, they wanted to kill Paul. This certainly qualifies as persecution. There's no doubt about it. Now, they recognized, or they thought they recognized, Trophimus of a, uh, from Ephesus. So we believe it could have been Alexander and some of those Jews who were there at this time. Now, it could be that they were mistaken. I mean, I, I'm open to giving them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Because remember, they've been on this journey for almost four years. Chances are they were pretty scraggly. You know what I'm saying? The, what they were wearing, their beards, their hair. And they finally got all cleaned up. They were washed, purified, they had on white robes, and they were clean shaven. No hair at all. So I could see where they could have mistook Trophimus as one of the four Jews who actually had taken the vow. But obviously, their motive, their intent was to come against Paul, to persecute him. And oftentimes, this persecution involves false accusations. And they were accusing Paul of teaching all men everywhere against the nation of Israel, against the law, and against the te temple. And this is very typical. In fact, it's kind of interesting as we're going through what we're going through in processing the new property and going through the county. We're still getting great opposition, of course, from the wineries and others and who just hate churches and hate, hate Christians altogether, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> and the persecution we're experiencing involves a lot of false accusations. I mean, they're saying things about us that, well, it's unbelievable. And especially me. I mean, you can't believe the things they're saying about me. Well, okay, maybe you can, <laughs> but most of it's not true, most. But persecution always comes with false accusations, and here we see for Paul, it's no different. So verse 30, it, this section goes on. It says, all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together. They seized Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now you got the picture, right? Paul's trying to appease the Jews and show them by his works, by his good deeds, that he's not coming against the law, against Moses, against the temple. He's trying to reach out to them on their own level, becoming all things to all men. They grab him, they seize him, they take him out of the temple area, and the door 
shuts on Paul to the temple. Now this is interesting because where are the Jews? They're in the temple. It speaks of the temple area, not the temple proper. That, of course, is just where the priests go into. But in the temple courtyard, we would say, that's where the Jews were. And the door for Paul to minister to the Jews was shut. He just didn't realize it. I find that very interesting because back in Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus, when Jesus called Paul into his service, apparently that is when God said, I'm going to take you from here and you're going to go to the Gentiles. Now we don't get that back in Acts chapter 9 when it happened. We get it in Acts chapter 22 verse 21 when Paul quotes Jesus on the road to Damascus when Jesus said, depart from here for you are going to the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? So the door to the Jews shut on Paul, but he didn't see it. He didn't recognize it. And I think for you and for me, this becomes a very important point. Because when God's given us a vision or direction or a desire to do something right on, we need to step out in faith and do it. There's no question about it. However, that season might change. God might shut the door on that particular area of service or that desire we might have or that vision we are wanting to experience. God might shut the door on it. And that's okay. But we need to see it. We need to recognize it. Or else we're just banging our thick heads against that door trying to bust it open. You say, well, Clark, how do we know when the God has shut the door on us for a particular area of service or for this or for that? Well, I, I think we would probably recognize it in two ways. Number one, when God shuts a door, typically, and we're still trying to break through the door, typically it results in a lot of effort, a lot of work. It's a lot of stress, a lot of strain, a, a lot of striving, a lot of heartache, a lot of headache. And we can attribute that either to being a work of the flesh or simply recognizing that our season is over in that particular area of service. But I think a second way we understand that is by other people. Other people recognize what God is or is not doing in our lives. We step out in faith and we do this or we do that and, and other people are saying, man, <laughs> that's awesome. There's a lot of fruit and I want to help. And, you know, and, and it's just a, a natural, fun work of the Spirit. Or people say, you know what, brother? That is not your gift. Please stop. You're making all of our lives very miserable. <laughs> so I think there's a couple of ways we can recognize the fact that God has shut a door. And I think quite possibly Paul wasn't really ready for that door to be shut, although it had been shut for quite a while. Well, back to Acts chapter 21. Let's come to a fourth thing we want to look at. We said there were only five, and that is the intervention for Paul. The intervention for Paul. In verses 31 through 36, we see that Rome intervenes. In verse 31, it says, now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was up in an uproar. Now, remember when Paul was coming back on his third missionary journey, he said he wanted to make it back to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost. So presumably, this is during the feast of Pentecost. And according to Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, Pentecost is one of the three out of the seven mandatory feasts required for every Jew to attend there in Jerusalem. Uh, it was the first feast, Passover, which of course includes unleavened bread, the fourth and middle feast, which is Pentecost, and the seventh and final feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And during this time, Jerusalem would be 
teeming with people, hundreds of thousands of people, some estimate almost two million people, which meant that the Roman occupation army that was um, centered in Caesarea would no doubt send large numbers of troops to Jerusalem to oversee the festival just in case an uprising uh, happened. And here, of course, it does. Now, according to verse 32, he immediately, the commander, took soldiers and centurions, commanders of a hundred, and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then, verse 33, the commander came near, took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and he asked who he was and what he had done. Now, according to verse 34, some among the multitude cried one thing, some another. Of course, it was a tumult. The crowd was in, uh, uh, you know, crowd mode. And when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldier because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after him, saying, away with him, away with him. Now, they were taking Paul from the Temple Mount up the steps into the barracks. Now, the barracks were located there on the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount in what was called the Antonia Fortress. So you've got the picture. Now, this is an interesting picture, something we've already seen back in Luke chapter 23 because this is the exact same place they took Jesus and they cried out the exact same thing in Luke 23 18 and on away with him away with him and you know that really struck me because what they're doing to Paul is the exact same thing they did to Jesus the persecution, the opposition, the false accusations, and calling for his death. And I think the reason it's important for us is because when we experience opposition, persecution, and people calling for our death, (laughs) which they do quite often, by the way, we're in good company. (laughs) We're in good company. Look, it happened to Paul, it happened to our Lord. And if it happened to them, why shouldn't it happen to us as well? Therefore, when we see it, we should really see it kind of like a badge of honor, if you will. Saying, you know what? That happened to my Lord. I'm okay with that happening to me. Well, let's come to the fifth and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. The fifth and final thing is the request by Paul. The request by Paul. In verses 37 through 40, Paul makes a request to speak to the crowd. Let's take a look. In verse 37, as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He said, can you speak Greek? Well, yeah, of course I can speak Greek. Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago, around 54 AD, raised an insurrection and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? No, I'm not him. I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a city of no insignificant city. I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, Paul will speak to the people in chapter 22, and it's very interesting as to what he speaks to them about. More on that next week. So, verse 40, when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs, he motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Now, Paul's situation was bleak. His circumstance was grim. He was in a very difficult, a very dangerous situation. And yet, yet, note carefully Paul did not see it as a bummer, but a blessing. (laughs) He didn't see it as opposition. He saw it as an opportunity, an opportunity to share with the crowd, as we'll see, Lord willing, in chapter 22, as he shares his testimony about what happened on the road to Damascus, hopefully to bring him to faith in Christ. And what a great picture that paints for us. Because chances are, 
many of us go through very difficult and devastating circumstances in our lives. Sometimes we go through great difficulties, situations and circumstances that are just, well, they're terrible, they're tragic. But the question is, how are we going to view them? How are we gonna look at them? Are we gonna look at it as a bummer or a blessing? Are we gonna see it as opposition or an opportunity? You see, when we understand James 1.17, that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there's no shadow nor variation of turning, now all of a sudden it's not category good or category bad, it's all category God. And whatever, whatever's happening in our hearts and in our lives, we, we understand Ephesians 1.11, that God is working all things according to the counsel of his will, whether we like it, agree with it, understand it or not. We rest in Romans 8, 28, because we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose, his will, his plan. And I'll tell you, what a great encouragement this should be for each and every one of us. Here, the prophecy of Paul is basically coming true. The Jews bound him, the Romans took him, and yet he saw it as an opportunity to share his faith with others. Father, help us. Help us to recognize that, well, as your children, everything that happens into or around us, Lord, you're allowing it to happen for your reasons, for your plan, for your purpose to be worked out in our hearts and in our lives. Therefore, Lord, let us see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to share our faith or an opportunity to grow, to mature, to be tested, to be tried, to be strengthened, to be equipped. Lord, whatever you want to do, however you choose to work, as that beautiful old hymn goes, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. So Lord, we just pray that by your spirit, you would help each and every one of us to rest in you, to know that you're going to orchestrate everything according to the counsel of your perfect will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you're here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, after service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, just to minister to whatever need there may be in your hearts and lives today. And I do pray that God would continue to bless you as you begin this new week. Man, it'd be a week like none other, that God would just do a great and mighty work in pouring out his Holy Spirit in your hearts, in your lives, leading you, guiding you, directing you, encouraging you, strengthening you, using you to do his perfect will. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.